down. We ask that you gather around whatever device you are watching us on and worship with us, because wherever two or more are gathered together, Jesus will be there. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and we light the candles of hope, peace, and joy as a sign of the coming light of Christ, who is called the Son of the Most High, and, and of, of whose, whose kingdom, kingdom there, there will be, be no, no end. With John the Baptist, we testify to Christ the light, so that all might believe through him. Heaven, Heaven and earth, earth will pass away. away. But, but the, the word, word of God, God endures forever. Let us hear. You heal the brokenhearted. Heal, heal us too. You free the prisoners from their jails. Free us from ourselves. Loving God, please come to us. And send us out, forgiven, to the poor, the brokenhearted, the imprisoned. Please join us in singing all praise to thee, for thou, O King Divine, was filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses in the Negev. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go forth weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. Please join in singing Amazing Grace.
Please pray with me the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Lord, we wait with eager expectation for the coming of your kingdom, when the humble will be exalted and the hungry fed. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come your, your will, will be done. done. Lord, we prepare for your advent with searching minds and contrite hearts, trusting in your healing spirit and redemptive love. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come your, your will, will be done. done. Lord, we watch with those who wait and weep, longing to see the rule of justice and the reign of peace. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your, your will, will be done. done. Lord, we seek you among the despised and rejected, knowing that there we will find your light shining in the dark. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come your, your will be done. Lord, we proclaim sight to the blind and liberty to the oppressed, trusting in your tender mercy and passion for justice. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come your, your will be done. Lord, we work with others to proclaim your truth, challenging the mighty and raising the meek. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come your, your will be, be done. done. Lord, we wrestle with our hopes and our fears, our struggles and our joys, laboring with creation to come to new birth. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your, your will, will be done, done on, on earth, earth as, as it is in heaven. In heaven. Amen. Amen. Let us now pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray for Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Together, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us sing, Come Thou Long-Expected Jesus.
come to the point in our service where we talk about Christian stewardship. There are many ways to give for Broad Street United Methodist Church. You can always mail your contribution. You can drop it off at the front door and through the mail slot. Or the easiest way is to donate online. All those options are shown to you on the screen. If you are just visiting us online today and are a member of another church, please support your local church. But any contributions to us will be gladly accepted. Now let us pray our offering prayer. Magnificent God, you created the universe and your wisdom shines through the laws of nature that we discern. In the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, you worked a miracle to bring salvation. Through your awesome deeds, you light an inextinguishable hope in our hearts. Help our congregation to work together in new ways to tell others your amazing good news. May our tithes and offerings support your work through our outreach ministries. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us now join in singing, Jesus Shall Reign. prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor 
and a day of vindication for our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for Zion's mourners, to give them a crown in place of ashes, oil of joy in place of mourning, a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. They will be called oaks of righteousness, planted by the Lord to glorify himself. They will, they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore formerly deserted places. They will renew ruined cities, places deserted in generations past. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
May the Lord be with you. I'm very happy to be with you here on this third Sunday of Advent. The theme of Advent is peace, hope, love, joy, all surrounding what we're waiting for as week after week we're preparing for Christmas. So let's get started today. When I served in Taiwan at the, as the pastor of the Taipei International Church, over the seven years that I was there, I performed many funerals. Uh, some of those funerals were for expatriates who were there and there was no way to ship the bodies home. And it was also some of the family members of the Taiwanese who lived there in Taiwan. But one of the things that uh, was going on there is because it's a small island, uh, they, they seldom buried anyone. Everyone was cremated, and that means that the families were given uh, the ashes. They were in possession of the ashes. And one of the really beautiful things there was that uh, on the day that we would commit the ashes, the committal service after the funeral, and the ashes had been collected, they would take the urn out. And in some of the uh, funeral, the, the cemeteries, you would, uh, they would dig the little hole, you would have the ceremony and you would commit the ashes to the earth, cover it over, and then they would plant a tree on top. I thought it was such a, a beautiful thing. Uh, in fact, most often now the funerals are with cremains. And part of the prayer that I say whenever there is uh, to be uh, the, the committal service would be to say uh, dust to dust, ashes to ashes. It's a prayer of committal. In fact, I'm in possession myself of several urns of ashes of my mom and dad and of my brother who passed away about three years ago. Some of the people keep the ashes and they take them and they pour them out over the water, uh, over the ocean, or maybe on a beach or in a mountain stream or wherever uh, that they felt that uh, it would be honoring to that, to that loved one. Ashes, that's what I'm thinking about today as I think about this passage of Scripture from the book of Isaiah. Uh, think about Ash Wednesday. Many churches that commemorate Ash Wednesday, uh, they burn the dried palm fronds from the year before that had been used on Palm Sunday. They burn them and make a little pot of ashes. And then part of the ceremony is to take the ash and put it on the forehead in the shape of a little cross. Why do we use ashes? What do ashes mean for us? Of course, within the funeral, it's the remains of that person. Uh, but it means there's no life there, that that person has gone. Uh, there's no life there. Ash Wednesday reminds us, and why we do that on Ash Wednesday is to remind us of mortality, that life is gone, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, that life is gone. In the Old Testament, in order to show grief and mourning, people would take ashes that wear maybe sackcloth, which is a rough kind of cloth around them to demonstrate their sadness, their, their depression, and they would throw ashes on their head into their hair. It was a sign of mourning, of grief. Some of it was personal. Maybe they had lost a parent or a child, or it might be national grief. That's what people did in the Old Testament with sackcloth and ashes to signify the mourning, the grief, personally and nationally. Ashes speak of sadness, speak of mourning, of depression, of loss, of grief, circumstances of, of deep loss. Sometimes it was an acknowledgement of defeat that the enemy had won and their power was broken. And it was taking one's place in the seat of desolation, wrapping oneself in a veil of discouragement and making that grief public, taking one's place in the seat of desolation, covering oneself with that veil of disappointment. Now we are in a time of global grief as many lives have already been lost to the coronavirus. Many lives are being affected. Our lives have been altered radically. Just think about what things were like one year ago today to realize that there was a joy, there was anticipation as we were getting ready for Christmas, but things have changed and it happened so rapidly. Our activities are curtailed. Our church right now is being shuttered in many of our congregations in the Methodist church and other churches around in the area and throughout the country 
are being partially shuttered. There's mask mandates everywhere. People are affected. Entertainment is affected. Restaurants, sports, everything is limited. And holiday celebrations this year are going to be very subdued. Many times families were not able to get together with their own children and grandchildren during the Thanksgiving holidays that we just went through. Is there any hope for us? Is there any hope to get out of this discouragement and this depressing? Somebody said on a Zoom the other day, I'm just depressed. And I understand that so much as the depressing circumstances. Is there hope for us? I believe there is. And I'm confident there is because in our text today, we have a word of hope coming straight from the heart of God that God will come and reverse our fortunes. God sends a message through a messenger with good news for all who mourn, to bind up the brokenhearted. God has a little exchange program, it says, to give a crown or a garland of beauty instead of ashes. Some translations say that a garland or a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of joy instead of mourning and a mantle of praise instead of discouragement. So let's examine this text for just a little bit from the 61st chapter of Isaiah. In the historical context, when was this written? Uh, Isaiah was written in several components. It's not just one book that was put together by one author at one time. It was edited together over many centuries. But in the 8th century was Isaiah of Jeremiah and many of the, Isaiah of Jerusalem rather, and many of his uh, poems and his words, his oracles and prophecies and stories about him appear in chapters 1 through 39. But uh, social circumstances had changed. That was in Jerusalem. But in 586, that was in the, when Isaiah was there, it was in the 8th century, the 700s. But in 586, over a century and a half later, Jerusalem had fallen. Israel had fallen. They were carried away captive over 500 miles to Babylon, and there they languished in servitude to the Babylonians. Isaiah 40 through 55 is another social circumstance. It began, as we said last week, with comfort. Comfort, my people, as God was giving a word that they were going to go back to Jerusalem, back home, rebuild their lives, but some time had passed. And in Isaiah 56 through 66, the part where our passage falls this week, they were back in Jerusalem. But things were not so good. They had enemies. There was discouragement. They looked around and they saw ruined villages, ruined city walls, buildings that had been toppled had never been brought back. And so they were filled with discouragement, with disappointment, with hardship, with loss, as they looked at cities in desolation and their hearts were heavy with despair. There comes the word of the Lord. Enter the word of the Lord. When the prophet says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now, this is a very interesting thing because some prophet that's unknown in the between the 6th and the 5th century is addressing the real circumstances the people in that very day. The Spirit had come upon him. What is Spirit? It speaks of the manifest or the, the uh, revealed presence of God, the effective presence of God. God's Spirit is uh, the power and the meaning of God in unity coming into the world where there is despair and some hopelessness. And that prophet speaking in about the 5th to 6th century uh, announces hope to discourage people, people who were living in Israel. They had returned, yes, there was some joy, but over time, things had not gotten better. They were still in bad situations with, situ with the cities laying in ruin. So it was good news that was coming in the midst of so much bad news. And here is the prophet's mission. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim release for captives and liberation for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and a day of vindication for our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for Zion's mourners, and to give them a crown in place of ashes, the oil of joy in place of mourning, a mantle of praise in place of discouragement. 
Those are words that are just brimming with hope. And of all these promises, it struck me that I really like that phrase. I will give them a crown on one's head instead of ashes on their head. The prophet encouraged God's people long ago that though their situation seemed so grim, something good was about to happen. With God on the scene, fortunes would be reversed and circumstances would change. God was pouring out the oil of gladness and wrapping them in the praise instead of discouragement, a garment of praise instead of discouragement. Here is what the prophet predicted that would be happening right before their eyes in their lifetime. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, he said. They will restore formerly deserted places. They will re renew ruined cities and places deserted in generations past. They heard these words and some took heart. Some wondered when might this happen? Some doubted, I'm sure. Some perhaps didn't believe. Maybe some even refused, walked away and mocked because it didn't all happen at once. When God announces something, it doesn't happen just like that. There's usually a period of waiting and hoping as Abraham waited for the promise or as Israel waited for the promise, uh, Abraham waited for the promise of the, of the promised son, to Isaac, to be born. For many years, Abraham and Sarah had to wait. Uh, Israel waited for a long time before they actually got to the promised land. Everything doesn't happen just like that. It takes time. But in time, Jerusalem and Israel experienced an amazing urban renewal as cities and towns were rebuilt. Ancient ruins were turned into bustling marketplaces and neighborhoods were filled with children playing in the streets. It's interesting to me that Centuries later, five centuries after these words, Luke chapter four says that Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. He went to the synagogue on a Sabbath, as was his custom. He called for the scroll. He asked if he could be the reader that day. They delivered him the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. He unrolled the scroll. And while he was standing there, he read those very words. The spirit of the Lord has come upon me, has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to relieve the oppressed, to comfort those who mourn, to speak of God's acceptable time. And he rolled the scroll up and gave it back to the attendant, sat down and said, today, these words are being fulfilled in your hearing. Those very words in Jesus's day, now it didn't all happen at once. There was still the crucifixion. There was still the suffering, the rejection. There was a lot that was going on, but Jesus was announcing something that that kingdom of God, that acceptable time of the Lord, when the mourners would be lifted up, blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Where the hungry would be fed, where those who hungered and thirst for righteousness would be filled. It had come in his day and it's still here with us today. So if you're disheartened, if you're discouraged, if you feel depressed, take heart. If you're in a season of ashes today, lift up your eyes of faith and behold these fitting words. Someone does love you. God loves you. And the creator is not against you, but the creator is for you. In fact, to these depressed and defeated and discouraged people, that's who the word of God came. God comes to us often in the time where we need him the most. And he says something really wonderful about them. In that text that we read from John, uh, from, uh, from Isaiah 61, it said, they will be called, the people of God, will be called oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord to glorify himself. Broad Street United Methodist Church is not finished. Yeah, we're having to shudder for a while. We're having to readjust. We've lost many of the traditions this year and many of our plans for our 250th anniversary. There's many things that I, I am unhappy about because we've had to adjust to the new situation of COVID-19. But we are not finished. We're not destroyed. We're not defeated. We're not cast down. I think about Jesus when uh, Peter, he said, what did the people say? Who did the people say I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father revealed it to you. And I'm going to call you Peter, the rock. And on this rock, that great confession that you have made that Jesus is the Christ, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We are a church that for 250 years, 
right here in Burlington, we have been confessing Jesus as our Lord and Savior, that Jesus is the Christ, the bearer of the new being, and he's the one who reconciles us to God. Our members, look around you. Think about the people in our church. We may be weak. We may be discouraged. We may not be uh, that gifted. We, we may have lots of problems in our life still, but the word of God came and said, you'll be called oaks of righteousness, deeply rooted, strong, able to weather the storms of life. We are planted here to glorify God and God has not uprooted us. Hope, hope springs forth because we believe in the one who brings life out of death, the one who binds up the brokenhearted, who comforts all who mourn, the one who crowns us with beauty instead of ashes, and who us, anoints us with the oil of gladness instead of mourning, who enshrouds us with a garment of praise instead of a spirit of discouragement. Take heart, church. God is with us. God is beautifying us even in these very difficult days. Keep the faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join in our closing hymn, Go Forth for God. the Son pour the riches of his grace upon you, and may the Holy Spirit, our comfort and our support, lead you in the path of hope and of peace, of joy and of love, both now and